Um, my name is Pamela Scott. I'm your program director for the Wesley Historical Society, and I want to welcome everyone here today. If you have never belonged to the Wesley Historical Society today, you can join for free. Do this. This is marvelous. There's, there's little forms right there on the end. Take it, fill it out, give it to Anne. Anne, raise your hand. She's in the back with the cranberry top. She'll take it. You'll be members, so thank you. Um, that's for one year. We have annual renewals, yes. Um, I want to speak on our next program, April 28th. This is going to be a showing of the documentary film Point Jude, Portraits of a Fishing Port. This is absolutely marvelous. This filmmaker, photographer has done such a study of Point Judith. It's, it's going to be a marvelous documentary. I really urge you to come. Uh, there'll be introductory comments by the filmmaker. His name is Mark Starr, and it was previously shown up at the New Bedford Heritage Fishing Center about two months ago. We're very fortunate to have him come. That's April 28th on Sunday at 2. Our annual, bless you, our annual meeting and dinner is also coming up Wednesday, May 15th, down at Venice. And again, see Anne in the back in the cranberry top for our tickets, and she will fix you up. It'll be quite a nice dinner and annual meeting. We do have a preview showing by Betty Jo Cagini of the film that will be shown on Rhode Island PBS about Benjamin Franklin and Joshua Babcock. And so it's going to be a very special dinner and evening, so please join us. That's what I have for you so far. This afternoon's speakers are going to be talking about the Wesley Library at Wilcox Park 125th anniversary book. Marvelous book. If you hopefully people are buying this, it's for sale over here at a special price today. Please make sure you get a copy. We're very excited to have some of our authors here today. And I'm going to turn this over to Maria uh, first to introduce the speakers and how today is going to go. But it's a marvelous book and we're very, very fortunate to have our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Good afternoon and I appreciate everybody being here at Full House on a really important basketball day, which we had no idea was going to happen <laughs> when we scheduled this. Um, just to start us off, how many people in the audience think that the library is a town department and the staff are town employees? You do not. <laughs> okay, so I am really happy that this is an educated audience um, who is aware that the library is an independent nonprofit association. So they build their budget from endowment, from annual fund, from state funding, as well as contributions from the towns of Stonington and Westerly, which are always in flux. Um, so as you know, it takes a lot of people. It takes staff over 125 years, volunteers, donors, to sustain a nonprofit organization of such excellence over that much time. So over the course of the afternoon, I'd love you to think about what a gift it is that Stephen and Harriet Wilcox gave us, Wilcox, the library and the park, really amazing things. Uh, that came to Westerly that the town, given their druthers, the town administration would not necessarily have supported. So thank you to all of our, our board members and everybody who has kept the organization going in such a wonderful way. So we're here because the library celebrated its 125th anniversary in 2017. And there was a suite of activities throughout the year, a uh, birthday party, many children's events, the tours through time, which were fun traveling throughout the building, uh, an exhibition that was up for two or three months about the library's history, 
And all of that brought together a lot of research. Bob Benson and Pat Grand did a ton of research for the tour through time, as well as the exhibition, and there was a great committee pulling information together. And I really thought I wanted to have something in print. All of that great data, pull it together, and put it on the record for the library's own uh, history, as well as to share with others. So luckily, Bridgette Hopkins, the director, was game to let us do that and contributed some work. And uh, Alan Peck, the park director, contributed as well, which was wonderful. Bob contributed. Um, Ellen Madison helped keep us all together and helped keep us edited and organized, which was great. And I wrote a chapter as well. But we started from Sally Coy's original book, um, Westerly's Living Memorial. I always have to think about that, which Bridgette is going to talk about. But she documented the library's history up until 1960. So we know what happened early on. But from 1960 to 2017, there was nothing in writing. And, and that's the chapter that I wrote, working from the great research that was done, as well as annual reports. So what we're going to do today is a brief overview of the book. And there, of course, is 125 years worth of data, so we can't cover it all in the next hour. I do invite you to purchase a copy or two or three of the book at a discounted price today. We'll have some time for questions afterward if anybody would like to ask questions. But the library is a very much a living, breathing space. Uh, things change. You can always go in and talk to the librarians and talk to Bridgette and talk to Alan about the park. And um, they're very accessible and wonderful people. So what we're going to do today is start off with Bridgette. She's going to cover the first half. I'm going to jump back up here, cover the second half. Bob's going to tell us about the friends. Ellen's going to tell us about the park. I think we're generally a fairly informal group, so if you want to ask questions, feel free. But we will have time for questions at the end, too. OK, ready? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, my name is Bridgette Hopkins. I'm the executive director. Westerly Library in Wilcox Park. I've been director since uh, 2014. Um, I actually have a background in architecture and historic preservation, so there's a lot. I'm probably going to focus a little bit more on that since that is um, uh, one of my passions. Um, but before I actually get into the uh, development of the association, I just wanted to talk about a couple um, people that are really inter were so integral into the development and life of the association, beginning with Sally Coy, who um, wrote uh, Westerly's Living Memorial. I have a, the original copy here that was published by the Historical Society and presented um, in April of 1963. So Sally Coy. Oh, you've got the clicker. Oh, I do have. Your other right. My other right. My other right? There we go. So, <laughs> so Sally Coy was the uh, longest serving librarian and director um, in the history of the association. She was actually born um, in Westerly on September 6, 1982, the same year um, that the association was formed. Uh, she was educated in Westerly and received a certificate in library studies from Columbia School of Library Service in 1928. Uh, she actually started um, working for the library under uh, the direction of the librarian at the time, Ethan Wilcox, in 1911. Uh, she rose in ranks, becoming assistant librarian and then librarian and director, um, which she held from 1930 to 1960. So the... Uh, Library movement in Westerly far predates um, our current Westerly Library in Wilcox Park. Um, as early as 1717, Reverend William Gibson, pastor of the Seventh-day Baptist Church um, in Newport, donate, donated a small collection of books, which then um, fell into the hands of uh, Thomas Hiscox, the town clerk and treasurer. Um, and it was his, at his discretion how the uh, books were distributed. Uh, the Pawcatuck Library Company that ended up uh, collecting these materials was granted a charter by the Rhode Island General Assembly in 1797. And it was or originally a subscription library with about 400 members. Uh, during the next 30 years, the books uh, passed from one town clerk to the next. 
uh, and then finally moved in 1872 to the old Academy building on Union, which was known as Cookie Hill, um, and then became the Union Free Library. Question? Yes. Do you know where that was? So this is supposedly where the current fire department is. Mm -hmm. And it was in the, on the westerly side of the river, but it was yes. the Tuck Library? Yes. Oh, okay. um, this, wow. I'm sorry? What do you, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. So this is supposedly where the uh, current fire station is. Um, it, the picture that, uh, that I uh, got from our local collection, um, on the back it was written that uh, there were boys and girls entrances to the, which is very interesting. Uh, this is a picture of the inside of the library. So um, from 1865, there were numerous suggestions in town for a Civil War memorial. Lots of other uh, towns in New England were doing it, so why shouldn't Westerly? Um, and nothing really was done about it until 1889, 1890, when there was a proposal for a monument that was, and about $1,000 was raised for this monument to be erected in Dixon Square. But it kind of just laid there, plans laid there. Nothing happened <laughs> until um, a man by Stephen Wilcox uh, made a proposition to the town. But before that, I'll just go back about Stephen Wilcox. So Stephen Wilcox was born on Abraham Lincoln's 21st birthday um, on February 12, 1830. Um, he showed, early on, he showed uh, a lot of talent as an inventor, and by the age of 23, he had um, close to 50 patents for a hot engine for a lighthouse to produce fog signals. And then at, three years later, he patented the first water tube boiler. Uh, and with his childhood friend, George Babcock, he established back. Babcock and Wilcox Company in 1867 to manufacture boilers for use. Um, from uh, including the first electrical generating companies in the world, including Brush Electrical Company in Philadelphia and the Edison Electric Illuminating Company in New York. Um, in uh, October 29, 1891, with the support of his wife, Harriet, um, Stephen asked to have a public meeting um, at the Old Town Hall on Cookie Hill. Um, here he announced that he had purchased, uh, there's uh, Stephen and Harriet, he had purchased the uh, route Jesse Moss property on Broad Street, uh, right on the corner of Dixon Square, almost about where the current post office is. Uh, he purchased this property and put up another um, amount of money, 15000 for the property, 10000 um, additional funds that he asked to be matched by the citizens of the community, which they did so in record time. Um, he envisioned uh, having a living memorial to serve the entire community, both in <coughs> Westerly and Pawkatuck, um, to provide quarters for the Grand Armies of the Republic, an auditorium for public meetings, museum space, a gym, a bowling, and a bowling alley. Uh, plans for the new building really became um, up in the utmost importance in the minds of the incorporators. And interestingly enough, he took them for a cruise along Rhode Island, uh, Long Island Sound, stopping in Bridgeport, where there was a property or a building, and I'm not quite sure which one, that he loved and they modeled the building, the library after that. Um, Longstaff and Hurd, who were architects uh, well known in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, had uh, designed a number of buildings, including uh, P.T. Barnum's house and P.T. Barnum Museum. And if you look at P.T. Barnum Museum and our library side by side, you can see um, all of the similarities. Um, it's really interesting. So um, the committee that raised the funds really did so in record time and uh, contracted Longstaff and Heard um, <coughs> of Bridgeport for 
just under $50,000. The library was designed in a Romanesque revival style. Um, that both visually divided using horizontal bands of ornamentation, yellow brick, sandstone, and terracotta roof, and a tower that rises above the roof line, very much like the uh, P.T. Barnum Museum. Unfortunately, Mr. Wilcox died of pneumonia uh, one year before uh, the library opened. Okay. The uh, building opened with a gym and a bowling alley. And I, I just actually marked up some uh, blueprints just to show everyone. If you haven't had the opportunity to uh, go down into the basement, you can feel free to contact myself or Bill Lancelotta, our assistant director, um, and we would be happy to show you. Um, actually, right here, any of the friends of the library that are familiar with the sorting room, that would be right here. And this is the office um, for when you walk in the memorial doors. Currently, at, it is the Koi Cafe and Sally Koi's former office. And these are just some photos of the old main reading room at the time. Uh, you'd, uh, might recognize those tables. We have one and the chairs uh, in the Old Maiden re Reading Room today. Uh, oops. Go back. Um, actually, right here, you, uh, the stacks were closed, so you had to go through a door up to a counter and actually ask for materials. And there it is again, right here. Is that where Ninigrit is through here now, yes. Um, before uh, the 1928 edition, there was a double-sided house um, on Broad Street. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this house, but it was actually split in two and moved to Newton, 22 Newton, and I believe this is 8 Park. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in 19, uh, 1898, the Rouse Babcock property uh, became available after Mrs. Rouse Babcock passed away. Um, the town was asked to purchase the property, I believe, four or five times, and they declined. Uh, and so uh, Harriet Wilcox uh, purchased the property for $38,000 in 1898 uh, for the purpose of a park. However, two years later, later, it was deeded over to be a high school with the caveat that if it ever stopped being a high school, it would come back to the association to be a public park. And so this is the corner of Broad, where Broad, Granite, and Elm meet. And this is Mrs. Rouse Babcock in the corner. And there you can see the high school next to the library. Yep. The town hall, I believe was built in 1911. We have pictures of it when they were laying the cornerstone. And there it is. So. And there's a, just a different angle. I love these pictures. So, um, Around the time that the high school was built, uh, Mrs. Uh, Wilcox, believing that the building should fulfill its purpose as a museum, proposed an addition of an art gallery to the rear of the building. Uh, the trustees were thrilled. However, they were running out of bookshelf space, so they said, 
um, we would love to have a museum as long as we get stacks. And so um, we currently have the glass floor room uh, in place uh, that house those stacks. Uh, this first edition actually um, contained the art gallery, additional stacks, and enlarged the gym that was in the basement. Uh, the art room um, had hardwood floors, highly polished, and wax, and the walls of the room were covered in red velvet velour um, and had overhead skylights for lighting. But in the evening, there were 100 incandescent lights. Is that weird? next 10 years, uh, from 1902 to about um, 1910, 1912, an average of 28,000 books were checked out per year. Uh, and that is uh, one book per card. They weren't allowed, no one was allowed to check out more than one book on a card. But by 1910, uh, checkouts were, per card was increased from one to two. And around the same time, uh, some of the areas of town were stricken with diphtheria and uh, the library would not loan materials to those people living in those areas. And if materials were, were returned from people living in those areas, they actually were destroyed. And the same year, 1910, um, the children's room was becoming very overcrowded, and so there was some shuffling of departments, and the children's room was actually moved upstairs, and that was my picture, um, upstairs into the auditorium. And it worked very well, except for the fact that children were going up and down those wooden stairs and causing a lot of noise. Apparently, kids fell down the stairs, and people were not happy at all. Um, in 1924, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wilcox's nephew, William Hoxie, um, who had been elected to the board in 1897, approached the trustees about uh, putting on an addition uh, to build a children's room with a museum below and an uh, art gallery above. And so this is a picture of the uh, children's room um, in 1928, the same year that the addition opened. And this is coming in, so if you come in through the main doors right now, we reinstalled the original doors to the children's room, although they're fixed. And um, that was the children's room off to the right, which is currently the audiovisual room. Uh, the museum. Um, I, we're not 100% sure, but these may be some of the uh, pictures from uh, the Wilcox's collection that were moved from the art gallery from the 1902 edition. What happened to that collection? So we have some of it. Um, I believe over the years, some of it was sold off. Um, it's been very difficult to track some of the, some of the artwork. That's one of our projects. And the museum below. And I believe this is in 1931, there was a uh, marine exhibit down in the lower level. Um, right now, this is, these are administrative offices. Uh, walls were put up. And my, oh, my office is actually right here. If anyone's been into the lower level, uh, Along here, if you can picture a wall, uh, that is the committee room. Um, just a few things um, with a few facts that some people have, some people might enjoy. Um, in by 1926, the Grand Armies 
uh, veterans stopped using their post rooms. And so these rooms became a uh, staff room, repair room, and uh, served as the entrance to the new stage that was built for the auditorium. Uh, and the same year, Ms. Sally Coy was appointed as uh, assistant librarian. Uh, shortly after, uh, she was appointed uh, librarian. Uh, she planned exhibits and other projects and as well as uh, did things sort of outside of uh, what we consider regular librarianship. Um, she oversaw the gymnasium uh, that had an average yearly enrollment of about 200 members. And I found a quote and I really thought it was cute. Um, she said, in spite of the fact that a shower including towel and soap cost only 25 cents, we sometimes had a small riot on our hands on Saturday afternoons if the water became too cool after a run of 20 or more showers. And this gym and showers uh, continued for about 57 years until the YMCA was built in 1952. Uh, there were extension services in town um, and circulation continue, continued to increase. Uh, in, I believe, 1956, there was an installation of an elevator and around that same time, fluorescent lighting on the main floor. Uh, nothing else was really changed. Uh, the book collection grew to, um, uh, by 1960 to about 140, uh, over 80,000 volumes uh, with a circulation of about 145 to 150,000 per year. Um, and by this time in 1960, 11 memorial book funds had uh, been established to enrich the collection and those still uh, sustain our collection today, along with other memorial book funds. And so we were, are very lucky that um, with, in terms of funding, uh, we don't have to worry about our book collection. If the market drops, we might, but um, we never will have to slash and cut our, our uh, book budget, which I am very grateful for because I know a lot of libraries have had to do that. And there's so many names that are mentioned um, in these books from um, facilities and park uh, workers to librarians. Um, I was hoping uh, David Rathbun's here. I know his uh, mother was a children's librarian here. And I'm sorry that I didn't, wasn't able to mention her by name. Uh, but buy the book and you'll be able to um, read all about her. Uh, um, the, by 1960 though, a lot of the, um, there were a ton of accomplishments. Um, in 1936, a program that they, uh, that the library offered was singled out for description in a publication of the U.S. Office of Education. And in 1953, um, Sally Coy was presented the Letter Librarian Award for, human, for the Humanizing of Knowledge and at the American Library Association Conference in Los Angeles. Um, uh, there was a 1956 award um, called the John Cotton Dana Publicity Award given to libraries of westerly size for thorough coverage in all media. Uh, li library directors continued to um, keep Westerly Library and Wilcox Park at the highest level, continuing to receive awards and grants um, and attract people from all over and really uh, make Westerly Library a model for other libraries. So I'll try and hit the second half of library history from 1960-ish to present. And this is also very much a story of the building and the changes in the building, which also reflect changes in library processes, all of which are handled by library staff. So again, I won't get to mention a lot of the individual library staff by name, but just know that there were dozens, if not hundreds of people making all of this happen throughout the years. So in about 1965, the Westerly Library became one of the four libraries in Rhode Island that were regional libraries, serving roughly Washington County and Block Island with additional services. 
and they were working with seven, uh, 13 smaller libraries, so maybe Ashaway, Charlestown, Hopkinton, uh, Richmond, providing reference information, book loans, specialized library service and advice, so uh, pushing out their collections to a broader geographic region, and this is all pre-computer. So this was somebody picking up the phone and calling to see if the library had a book, picking up the phone or coming in in person to ask questions. And the <coughs> Westerly Library was recognized in this region as the best one to offer that service and receive some state funding for that. Then a little bit later, in 66 um, and 67, our director, Walter Herkett, up there, decided it was a little bit time for a renovation, interior renovation. He, he had enough building, I think, to work with, but wanted to readjust the spaces within. And he opened up the entire first floor to public service. Before, there had been those closed stacks that Bridgette mentioned, but remember now we're in, the, we don't have the 1992 wing, so we've just got that L. So that entire first floor went into public service and patrons could browse open stacks. And they moved the circulation desk out of the reading room into what had been Sally Coy's office which is now the Koi Cafe, right in the middle of the lobby there, centralizing that. There were a lot more seats and study carols on the first floor. He also added some carpeting to help quash some of that noise from the kids, um, just to make it a little bit quieter in the space, and reopen the art gallery. And the, the gallery has its own interesting story through the years of uh, being supported and, and being a little bit more accessible or less accessible, depending on staffing and actual physical accessibility of the space. In 1967, in April, there was a rededication of the redecorated library where Governor John Chafee attended. And then there were an additional two weeks of special programs about the launch and uh, activities and services. So this starts a pattern of library renovation and construction related to anniversaries. 1967 was the 75th anniversary of the library's founding. And we'll see that again in the centennial edition and later on. Uh, also, during this time, there were some financial troubles, and that's going to come up throughout the history of the library as well. In the late 70s, there were some decreases in town and state support. There was inflation. There was an unstable stock market. This is all sounding familiar, I think, to modern day people. And the library had to cut staff and had to cut hours. They actually had to spend from their endowment principle, which nonprofit people know is not a good idea. So they started their first endowment campaign in 1975 with the goal of raising $500,000, which doesn't sound like much today, but was a lot, I think, in 1975, um, just to try and enhance their investments so that they had a little bit more money to pull from. By 1980, under the leadership of Director David Pansera, they did return to a balanced budget, but it was not easy. They had to cut their service hours from 64 and a half to 44 hours a week. So they slashed them by a third and had to get a special dispensation from the state in order to do that. They did uh, over time rebuild their investment portfolio and brought in more incorporators who acted as advocates and uh, promoted the library within the community. So all of those efforts together worked to help get the library back on more stable financial footing one of the next big trends in the library is computerization, and this really changes both the library's internal processes as well as the services that it can offer to the public. The first computer in the entire library was purchased in 1981 to support the library's first annual fund drive. So they used the computer to uh, help with the mass mailings. This is not it, this is from 1983, a sample computer from that time. And from 83 to 86 is really when the library started to computerize its systems. It took three years. So this is when we went from that big card catalog with all the teeny little drawers that you'd have to pull out to the computerized system. And it took a lot of time to transfer that data into the computer. But it is inefficiency because now the library could link to multiple other public libraries across the state through a mainframe and mainframe, remember mainframes? Mainframe in Providence and the patrons would be able to see what other libraries had on the computer and see if it was on the shelf or not. So they couldn't necessarily request it at that point, but they could see that a book was up in Providence and go up there and get it. This also improved staff procedures 
because they could uh, add books to the collection more quickly and get them out on the shelf more quickly using standardized catalog records that existed. Let's see, this actually helped to phase out the regional library system that was brought about in the mid-1960s. Now things are starting to be computerized, people can find information a little bit more quickly, the reference desks are a little bit more able to find the resources they need. And by the early 90s, that entire regional library system had been defunded. I do want to mention public internet access, which hit the library finally in 1997. So about 22 years ago, you could go to the library and borrow a computer and go online and do some searches. So it, it's really within recent history. It's within my time working and, and being part and associated with the library. The Centennial Edition. Oh, my picture doesn't show up either. Ah, oh, I apologize. There are some really great pictures that aren't coming through. This is um, David Pansira. Um, shucks. I wish you could see these. Even in 1983, 10 years before, nine years before, he predicted that there was going to be a need for more space. Uh, and he commissioned a space study. It wasn't until 87 or 88 when they said, oh my god, David, you're right. We need to gear ourselves up here. And at that point, they recommended adding 20,000 square feet of space, which is a not unsubstantial addition. And that was supposed to meet the space needs for the next 25 years. They hired an architect, Charles Colbanus, who was local. And he was really tasked with the job, not only of building some of the other wing, but integrating those other three wings. So there are really four separate distinct buildings floors are all kind of funky different levels, the mechanical systems are all different, and he had to sort of slot a wing into the back there and make it work with the other wings, which is a, not an easy task in terms of just leveling. Our, you know, architects would, would get that. But in the entire new wing, he was able to put a lot of book stacks in the basement, so moving the nonfiction collection downstairs. Reference came to the third floor, sorry, to the first floor of the new wing. The children's room moved to the second floor of the new wing, and then there was a meeting room on the third floor. So a huge stack of services in that wing. They also added some elevators, those two new modern elevators to get everybody between those four different floors. And that freed up some space in the 1928 wing, so special collections could go down in the lower level. And then based, the periodicals and new materials were on the first floor. Um, in a way uh, as they have been recently. So again, renovation, expansion, fiscal crisis. They go hand in hand, particularly in spring 91 to 92, like right as the building was under construction, things were happening. The library lost unexpectedly about $140,000 in funding from Stonington and the state. But that's for the annual fund and the operating budget. Luckily, they had enough money to continue with the construction from a separate pool of money and persevered. Thank goodness they did. That space is amazing. And in March 29, 1992, there was a rededication of the space with the governor, Bruce Sundlin. Senator Pell came down, Senator Claiborne Pell came, and Jack Reed, who was a rep at the time, came as well. And uh, I do want to give a shout out to Jack Reed, who's now our senator, who has been a lifelong fan of libraries and is a national advocate of libraries. So if you ever see him, give him a rock on, Jack, for, for his support. And in 1992, so the Centennial Wing opened up right about the 100th anniversary of the library's founding. So again, that pattern of renovation and anniversary. And another renovation under the auspices of Director Catherine Taylor from 2010 to 2011. Again, this started earlier with a space study in 2003. So just 11 years after the library had opened, they said, you know what? Technology has changed significantly. Remember, all of that technology came in in the 90s. Um, the public access computers were coming online. The, com the catalogs were changing. The space was changing. How they used it was changing. So they did another space study in 2003 and a, a funding feasibility study with the goal of reconfiguring space. They had enough floor space, but now it was time to sort of reconfigure and rejigger inside. Some areas were underused, some were a little bit overutilized, overcrowded. So how to work that out? Um, 
coincidentally, financial troubles, crash of 2008, right? Boom. So as the library is trying to fundraise for these renovations, we are all cut. We are all hit by a financial situation. And the library's investments decreased in value by 17% over the course of a year. That's a big hit. But they persevered. Um, they moved forward. And again, um, these are some pictures that actually came through. Uh, the children's room moved again. So the poor children's room has been in every single building in the entire library at some point. Uh, and now it's in this fabulous space. It's in the lower level. It's got this great story garden off the back. I love how the architects have continued the curves in the space throughout. The reference and young adult areas moved to the second floor. And this is the first time that the teens had their own sort of space. They had a little room region in the back of the second floor there. And an actual young adult librarian, which was fabulous. And at that point, also administration moved to the lower level, as Bridgette indicated. The old main reading room was restored back to some of the photos that Brazette was showing us with those gorgeous light fixtures and the, um, there's an integrate you can see and the old chairs, fabulous, gorgeous, shininess. And uh, I don't have a picture of it, but you remember that open staircase that went up? Yeah, that was totally freaky up to the children's room. Luckily that came out and opened up a lot more floor space as well. And this was another opportunity to integrate the mechanical systems among the, among the wings there. And that was a, a lovely one. And then Bridgette came, which was great. And even in that short period of time, between the 2010 renovation and 2016, libraries are changing. And I think a lot of people still think of the library as the warehouse for books. And this is really not true in the 21st century. It's a community space. It's a place that brings everybody together. It's a place that is trusted, that's neutral, where everybody can meet up. And uh, there are new things happening. Nationwide, libraries are giving more space to teens. And that's exactly what Bridgette saw, wanted to invest in the growth of the teen program and gave them their own space. This was two weeks ago. This is what the space looks like now down on the first floor. So these renovations from this time period were really about providing those new services that were appropriate for a library, again, in the 21st century at this point. The teen space dedicated as well as the maker space. And that's a, a new thing in libraries as well, bringing people together to create and to make in person in real time, not just online anymore. So a lot of the equipment that people may not have uh, the time or the money to purchase for themselves or the expertise to learn, but it's here in this common space where they can all share it and come together and use it. And, and this is just a tiny corner of the maker space. If you've been in the library, it's this amazing spot. And they've gotten a couple grants to really enhance the technology in that location. So I do encourage you to, to go in and, and take a look at that. Could you expand on the teen programs and what kind of attendance you have at those? Do you know attendance? So attendance, uh, we found with teens, uh, we found that uh, uh, planning a program ahead of time, they forget. <laughs> and so, <laughs> So we do a lot more drop-in, um, but on a regular day, there could be anywhere from 10 to 20 kids in the space. Uh, we have regulars that come every day. Uh, we also have a teen advisory board. Um, this, and with the teen advisory board, they actually help design their teen space. We move them in. They, they lived in it for a little while and said, okay, this is how we want it to function. And so we actually let them help design the space um, so that they really had some ownership in it. Um, probably we have maybe a total of uh, at least probably four or five programs a week. Yes, I noticed on the website that yes. I get all the time. There's yes. lots of programs. And they're, they're actually even doing a lot of advocacy and made a difference in um, uh, stop, they had asked, um, the course of Westerly not to um, sell Mylar balloons anymore at the Summer Pops. And so that was one thing that they helped stop was the Mylar balloons because they kept going off everywhere and they don't uh, degrade and that sort of thing. So um, they're, I think they're having a lot of fun and more and more teens are coming through the space. Um, and really, it's really 
really exciting. And I think that echoes what's happening throughout the library right now. Again, the library is that community space. And when the programs that they're offering, it really brings people in. They're not just there to sit and read a book or check out a book and go home. They're there to be part of a community and part and engage with other people. So that's what the library of the 21st century is. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Bob for the friends. My name is Bob Benson. <clears throat> I've been involved in a volunteer uh, as with the library for a lot of years and with the friends for about 20 years. So I'm familiar with the, uh, with the organization. And I'll go through its history and I'll also add some promo in it in, uh, about the organization. We have membership applications over there. Um, so in the spring of 1972, Bill Alexander, who was the library director at that time, um, suggested to the board, and the board encouraged him to do this, that he meet with a number of community members to discuss the formation of a friends organization to support the library. So he went ahead and did that, and the people that he met with, I think they're familiar names of the past, Joe Lewis, Faye Rand, Betsy Nacarado, Gene Ladd, and Pam Crandall. There may have been more, but those are the ones that I found in the documentation. And he came up with nine ideas, which are stated there. And of those nine ideas, I think the friends now really focus on two of them, number four and number eight. Um, by the middle of May, these folks had formed a committee and um, established bylaws. They had elected Joe Lewis as president and Lucretia Ritchie as the membership chair. And within six months, Lucretia did her job well because she had 225 members of the Friends. Um, they had a fee structure, starting with a student membership for $1. We recently reintroduced that, and it's now $5, so that's not a bad increase. And <clears throat> from student to patron. Patron then was $100. Patron now is two hundred and fifty dollars. This is a minimum. You can, you can go up to twenty five hundred or twenty five thousand if you wish. We haven't found any of those yet. <laughs> so, in the early days, n number four was the focus to help acquire the uh, important materials, sort of beyond what the what the library was capable of doing uh, with their budget, special products, special books, and some of those are still on the shelves. I think. Uh, and if you look in the front, front end piece of, the, of those books, there will be a, uh, a label that said they were gift of the friends. But <clears throat> just the membership fees uh, were really insufficient to do what the friends thought they could do. So <clears throat> the idea of a book sale was introduced in um, 1975. And we are now entering the 44th year of that sale, which will be occurring as later this summer. <clears throat> so the, the first sale they were, to get the books, an ad was placed in the Wesley Sun. And the books came in just as they continue to come in now. The first sale was at the Armory. I don't know how many days it was, but it yielded $2,000, which was not too bad. Um, the sale over the years have used other venues, particularly the YMCA, and I, I, I want to note how generous the Y has been in their hospitality and hosting the book sale over the years. Um, we've made some changes. We don't use it any longer, primarily because of the changes at the Y when they went under their most recent renovation. It just made it physically very difficult to get the books in and out. Plus, we were taking a gymnasium for about 10 days, and some of the members were complaining. <clears throat> but the cooperation with the Y exists with the cooperation of other nonprofits in town, including the Historical Society and the Babcock Smith House, and how we uh, benefit from cooperating. And that's evident in the park each summer with, um, with um, Virtue and Pops and Shakespeare, again. So <clears throat> to, to conduct the book sale, many volunteers are needed, and it's an, an ongoing process throughout the year. There are volunteers 
on a daily basis down in the sorting room, the area that Vijay pointed out earlier, uh, the sorting room and the storage room. Uh, the books never stop. We, uh, we now have two sales, a holiday sale in December and a larger sale in, in the summer. And uh, we'll continue that. I think that uh, over the years, and a ballpark estimate is we've provided the library close to a quarter million dollars from the book sale. So that will continue, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, I don't know what would happen if, for some reason, the sale stopped. I, I don't know how you deal with how the circulation desk would deal with the, the books that are donated almost on a daily basis. <clears throat> there were other uh, means of raising money. Some years ago, Lito Machetti published a book, edited a book called Life's Little Pleasures, which was a series of photographs taken by a local photographer from the first two decades of the last century, which showed how nice life in Westerly at that time could be, or was. Uh, we sold merchandise, and book bags, t-shirts, capes, uh, cups and calendars, and that sort of thing. Doesn't match what the book sale yields. We've also contributed financially to certain projects and events. Uh, one was the um, helping repair the damage from the 1977 vandalism, which an artist certainly remembers, sadly. <clears throat> we sponsored a World War II oral history project. We bought the first personal computer for staff use. I think that was consistent with what was shown before. And um, sponsored a pop wild flower and shrub program a few years ago. The handsome uh, bike racks that are in the park and on the Esplanade provided by the friends. The microfilm machine, if you've ever had an opportunity to use that, you'll see how effective that is. It's up on the second floor in reference. Uh, the doors and memorial doors were refurbished about 10 years ago, sponsored by the Friends, and they're being done again. Um, they suffer from the weather. The AV system, the audiovisual system in the auditorium, along with the window treatments, which are relatively new, done by the Friends. Um, and also the publishing costs for the book that we hope you purchase if you haven't already over there was done by it was provided by the friends. <clears throat> the friends have also sponsored many programs, and uh, I want to point out several, which I think many of you remember. Brides of Wilcox Park. Do you, any of you remember that? Okay, good. The 100th birthday cake and birthday singing uh, 25 years ago, 27 years ago. Do you remember that? Good. Literary men, women, and children of the past with the past. Do you remember those? Yes, good. Well, Donna Silico, a friend, is responsible for those. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm waiting to see what she'll come up with next. After the, after the um, last program, Literary Children of the Past with the Past. Hmm? The what? Literary pets. That's a joke. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, Famous you, animals. That's the same as well, that's what I was going to say, John. That it was suggested that she consider literary animals. And yeah. Just think of what you could no, do. <laughs> that's what she said when I suggested that before. Well, what you could do with Bob out the elephant, man. <laughs> okay. Um, also, Boxing in Westley was a program. Larry Hirsch put that. We helped Larry Hirsch do that. Baseball in Westley, which was done by Donna, also and very popular. The place was, you can't sell out a free, a free presentation, but it was sold out. Uh, <clears throat> there were concerts, George Kent, U.S. Coast Guard Jazz Band, um, Puppet Workshop, a, an acapella group from Conn College, and, and many, many more authors who gave readings, Robert Cormier, Linda Greenlaw, Ann Hood, Wally Lamb, and others, and their uh, 
volumes are in the library. And then, finally, I think it, it's sort of a uh, less tangible um, contribution that the friends make to the library in that people who become involved with the friends uh, gain an appreciation for the value of, of the library and continue on in their volunteer, uh, in their volunteer efforts for the library to the extent that several friends members have become board, uh, president of the board and board members. And I think that's really an important aspect of it. Now, <coughs> um, the books are for sale over there. There are friends memberships there. How many of you are members of the friends? Oh, good. We can use a lot more. Okay. okay. Do you have any questions? Alan? Good afternoon. So if I seem a little bit stiff today and crooked, it's because I worked all day on my truck brakes yesterday, and in the process I messed up my own alignment. <laughs> but I think I can get through this. Um, I wanted to read a little bit from, from the book. Um, so Wilcox Park continues its legacy as serving as a place of respite to the surrounding community and for all those who take the time to stroll its grounds. Although much has changed in the world over the past 120 year history, the underlying function of the punk has remained a constant. People continue to seek the nurturing aspects that the rolling landscape abundantly provides. Here, peace, tranquility, and inspiration can be found flowing out of every nook. And I didn't want to forget to thank Maria Bernier for guiding us, all of us, through this, this process, as well as Ellen Madison for her expert uh, editing. Um, whenever, I'll second that. <laughs> Um, and there's so many um, things that come off of Bob. There's, there's so many. When I started this process, I took, um, I was coming after a foot operation, so it was perfect. I was able to read through everything related to the park and local history, everything related to the park um, in the old Wesley Sun news clippings and all the annual reports. So I put all this stuff together and, for example, how Maria helped is I was thinking, okay, I'm going to do this chronologically, but that didn't make enough sense. So instead, kind of chose some themes of horticulture, collaboration with different community organizations and uh, some of our fantastic monuments and uh, statuary throughout the park. Um, whenever I give a tour, no matter if they're like a senior group or um, first grade or, or ch school children tour, I always tell them Wilcox Park is really three things essentially. We're uh, a, a, collect a horticulture, we're, we're an arboretum or a museum of living trees. We're also a community space Whereas over its 100-year um, history, everything's always been free and open to the public, and that continues today. And we're a collection of those historic monuments and memorials throughout the park. Um, I'm going to do a little more reading, just because it really hit home with me. And this is from uh, Frank Greenman, and was published in the Wesley Sun in 1921. Of all those pretty spots around, in daylight or in dark, I find no spot in all of the town that excels Wilcox Park. All strangers come into town with time to look about, admire and praise the beauty spot without a single doubt. It matters not what the stand you take to view its well-kept ground, whether from street or seat within, there beauty doth abound. Sometimes I sit at foot of hill across the lake so fair and watch <coughs> the fountains spouting forth to cool the heated air. Sometimes I stand upon the slope close by Grove Avenue, and gaze across the shady ridge and High Street entrance too. At evening, time I like to view, when shades of night d come down, the light that helps to beautify the loveliest spot in town. My favorite view is from the ridge, from seat above band stand. Of all the views within the park, none other is more grand. With light and shadow is just right, and all the grass is green, the grand old trees and winding paths present a lovely scene. Convenient fonts are placed therein when every son and daughter can quench their thirst with which that flows, bright, sparkling, clean, clear water. The trees spread out their leafy palms to catch the cooling breeze, and birds above the singing psalms in elms and other trees. I much admire the 
merry songs in the sweet morning air, while bees are busy mid the flowers around me everywhere. Caretakers busy every day in good old summertime are doing the best they can to make the park look fine. In winter, too, the many paths are freed from ice and snow, and we enjoy the various walks no matter where we go. Some summer nights, our good old band gives concerts in the park, and thousands come from home around to hear the music hark. We all are grateful, everyone, I often hear such remark in relation to the kindly gift of this, our noble park. All honor to the memory of those who made the gift. I'm sure for Wilcox Park we do, a grateful voices lift. May future generations too near fail to give due praise for this grand gift of Wesley throughout all coming days. So I think that's safe to say, you know, we've done that. We keep on appreciating the park for all of the different things that it is. Um, this first slide here, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is an example of a current project we're doing with interpretive signs. These are going to be installed in about six weeks from now, and we're addressing the uh, landscape architects responsible for Wilcox Park, as well as some of the ecological features of the park, like the aspect of being an arboretum, and um, the historic structures in the, in the park, including, <coughs> including the library. So it's an exciting project. People will be able to take away a little bit more than they may already know. Um, so I'm going to advance that with this. Warren Manning is the original designer of Wilcox Park, a pioneer in the field of landscape architecture, as much as the famous Frederick Law Olmsted. Warren Manning is a founding father of the American Society of Landscape Architects, and he's the very reason and the great condition of the park that we are elevated to um, being nationally significant. 99% of the National Register listings are locally significant. We're nationally because we're a prime example of Warren Manning's work. He did work for Frederick Law Olmsted for 12 years. Frank Hamilton desi uh, yeah, designed the landscape for the 1905 edition of the Brown Estate, including the two knolls and the depression that he turned into a pond. And Arthur Shercliffe um, also sought help. He went to Frederick Law Olmsted when he was an older gentleman and had him cobble together a, a curriculum that would be suited for a landscape architect because that didn't exist in the time. And so I told him to go take surveying, go take horticulture, and on and on. Arthur Shercliffe's responsible for our war memorial, our balustrade, the memorial fountain, and uh, he's also the first um, professor of a four year landscape architect program that was in Harvard. The pond was built in 1907 in Frank Hamilton's design. We redid it as part of our master plan, and the guiding principle on our master plan was to retain the historic integrity of Wilcox Park. So I thought it was a big opportunity first to maybe change it up a little bit, and uh, we came back to that as being the guide that we, we really needed to retain the concrete coping in the same shape. And it's been a popular spot for, for ice skating. The winters aren't as uh, what they used to be in my 18 years at the park, we've only had one good winter for about a two-week stretch where the pond ice was solid and smooth. And we say that people have to cooperate with Mother Nature and leave it alone, let it set up. Uh, Warren Manning had this design, this, this uh, stone footbridge, which was constructed in 1905. Um, the park used to be a, a river valley going into the um, Pawkatuck River. It was natural valley and he was kind of an environmentalist before his times and, and said, you know, people really need to respect and protect the, the uh, watershed above. And it didn't happen. New chemicals were introduced, people cleaning their things. And at this time, the, the runoff from houses went into the, the stream. So all of trout went belly up. It started to smell. And in 1929, they, they put the entire stream underground. Our band is a big story in itself, being the oldest continuously active civic band in the country. And our beautiful 1902 bandstand was built for them in mind. The arboretum aspect of the park is second to none. We have um, nine state champions. So this is a list that the uh, Rhode Island Tree Council maintains. And is a formula between the height, the canopy spread, and trunk diameter 
that determines whether a particular tree is a champion for that species. And uh, so we have nine, which is the most of any one property in the whole state. And we're continuing the succession of trees. Um, people come to me sometimes, they're so sad and heartbroken when a tree comes down, but I remind them as an arborist, it's our responsibility. Um, every living thing has a, a beginning and an end, an expected life span. And when a tree goes into demise, it potentially can be highly hazardous, dropping a large limb. Every square foot of the park is considered a target. People might be anywhere. So we <coughs> do the responsible action of taking down trees that have um, physical issues, but we're continuously planting new ones. So we're gonna have, this, we have a great succession of young, middle-aged, and older trees. This is the uh, bike rack that Bob Benson mentioned, um, gift of the uh, friends. This one's placed right outside of the library and we have a second one off of High Street by the pond. Everything's um, kind of large scale in the park. You know, you collect your leaves from your own home property, it might be a dozen bags or so. Here in the park, I calculated this year because I, we, we, we will compost our leaves and perennial clippings, but we were totally full. So this year I brought them to the compost facility at the transfer station, and it was in the magnitude of, of 20 to 30 tons of dry leaves. So. Here's our memorial fountain. Uh, the, the weeping cherries are meant to mimic the falling waters of the, uh, the statuary in the middle. Um, and one neat detail as a stonemason is that fact that they Arthur Shercliffe designed the blue stone paving around the, the space, and instead of just picking up on the staircase and four sides of the octagon, he picked up on all eight sides of the octagon, mm -hmm. which centers you. If you're standing on one of those things, the, the joints are in the direction of the fountain. Our champion trees range in size and species, of course. Um, this is our Swiss stone pine super dense because it retains seven years of its needles as opposed to our, our native white pine which only has two years and that's its natural egg shaped profile. A really neat black gum with twisty branches called zydeco twist. And that's my slides. Um, so I'm going to leave you on this one. Okay, fine, there it is. Um, and ask if anybody has any questions. Yes. Um, aside, aside from the high school and the house that was split, you see here, yes. was there any demolition done to create this space? There was a significant amount along, um, you know, near the War Memorial space there, up along there, and uh, on the Brown Estate itself, that was the only piece of land that was mostly <coughs> open. You know, it had the um, the pond, but we think the cottage perhaps <coughs> was in place there. Um, we understand the barn was moved, but we y haven't yet figured out from where. Um, but yes, the, I'd say the majority of the houses that were raised were up along <coughs> the um, Broad Street to Granite area going into the Wobble Well. <coughs> yeah. um, have you had any problems with the water being underground? Was with the irrigation, the street? No. with the, the culvert coming through, we have, yeah, and the town's still working on it. They're, they're actually stopping by still. There's, um, I don't know what year, but at some point, they separated the sewerage systems from the stormwater runoff system. And um, we are st they're still getting contamination a um, little bit, and uh, the DEM has made it so that they have to resolve it. So they did dig up and disturb a whole area. We had to take down a, a very healthy American beech tree just to do that. Uh, but, um, did you replace it? I've replaced it with a blue uh, Atlantic cedar, yeah. yeah it's going to provide better screening on the end of the park. Yes? Um, could you talk a little bit about the bandstand? I know it was renovated a few years back, and I'm really sure yeah. the cone and how that worked. Yeah, so yeah, 2017, um, a complete restoration including, um, and totally funded too, through uh, Rhode Island Historic Preservation Heritage Commission and matched with the 1772 Foundation. Um, so what we did there, and previous to that, all it had done to it is paint jobs and new cedar shingles on the roof. So we went, everything in the park should be the highest quality, you know, so now it's a yellow, Alaskan yellow cedar roof. And the posts 
um, the, the contractor uh, did a really brilliant thing in that um, he took uh, two by eight dug firs and laminated them all together to create its unique five-sided posts. So they look original and it's, it's actually stronger than a singular large piece of wood. Um, we put this time around, what failed with posts last time is ground, ground contact. So the ground contract, as you know, um, the moisture will seep up and rot the bottom of the posts. So this time we had uh, custom aluminum shoes made so that the new posts are sitting above. Um, so yeah, new roof, new posts. Um, it's very unique uh, funnel-shaped ceiling. It's a fun question for the, the school tours and what do you guys think this might be for? And they always usually get it right. You know, it's, it's kind of obvious that it's gonna project the, the music out. Yes? And how about these bathrooms? The, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, the comfort station, as it was called. Um, I believe it was 1911, originally built by Sherman and Sons, the same contractor who built the bandstand. Um, it was used up until like the 1950s and 60s, from what I understand from talking to locals over the years. Um, we have made the efforts um, to protect the exterior. So Pawkatuck Roofing Company put on a beautiful um, it's barrel style roof that matches the library, um, but it's nice in that it's a composite plastic. So it's actually more flexible and we think it's actually gonna last longer. Um, the copper, so the exterior, was continuing to work on the exterior. I wanna put hurricane uh, proof windows on there, not for hurricanes, but for vandalism, unfortunately. And there's a beautiful art and craft uh, window grates, really beautiful press steel details that are going to go back up. Thought I would paint it yellow to match the library brick to make people can make the association of uh, all one property. Um, and there's been grants I've looked at in the past where you can keep it open for a minimum of was, was very little, maybe 13, 14 days a year, and open to the public and keep it as um, space, uh, you know, be able to qualify for this grant. Um, that hasn't happened. So many ideas over the years. Coffee shop, superintendent's office. Um, right now, focus on protecting it so it doesn't go away. The Rhode Island Historic Preservation is very happy that we haven't raised it because the greater majority of them throughout Rhode Island have been raised. Um, and we, we do use it for storage, you know, it's summer pops and Shakespeare in the park. Um, but yeah, going to concentrate on the exterior, including the drainage that will get the water away from the back. And then that will leave the possibility of doing something other in the future. The original intention. Yeah. The original intention. So, yeah. So the only time you're out of luck is on a Sunday, because the library has, I believe, 17 bathrooms or something crazy. You know. So there's lots and lots of bathrooms in the in the thing. I mean, even back then they had a gentleman in the men's and a, his wife, or a woman in the women's. And you know, imagine these days how much we would need to, to watch uh, the activities that might go on inside a private thing. Yeah. I, yes? Has there been a lot more work done on the back of the years? There has, unfortunately. And I always say it's sporadic. It's always thoughtless, but it's always sporadic. And you can't ever quite figure out what motivates people to do stuff. Um, but we've caught a few. You know, we do have a few surveillance cameras outside now. Um, I caught a guy red-handed, you know, carving up a beautiful Japanese maple tree, and he was claiming he didn't have it, but I could see he was sitting on something shiny, and so I'm like, what's that? We actually tracked him down with a golf cart while we were calling 911 and got him. So that was kind of neat. Um, and we, we, we maintain a, a list of no trespass, because as private property owners, we can say that individual's not allowed on our property anymore. And so then we see them, we can call the police, and then the police have something to go, because if we don't, issue a no trespass against them, then we can't just say, oh, he's doing something bad, I want him gone. We, we actually have to have that status on him. So. Um, the water in the pond was a story in itself that I neglected to talk about in the chapter, but um, from the Smith Quarry just down the hill road here, um, when it was abandoned as a granite quarry, they uh, let it fill up with the springs. And from early years to um, around uh, 2005, our water for the pond was still coming from the quarry hole. Um, I have a, a 
shows going all the way through. You'd have to open a cap and bleed out the ear pockets on, on Summer Street and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it had come down to such a trickle with a, like a half mile of pipe and all the leaks in it. Um, that was kind of a blessing in disguise when Hoxie sold that property and said we could no longer use it. And what we did in turn was change our 25 gallon per minute uh, groundwater pump into a 60 gallon per minute with a procedure called the hydrofracking that opens up the veins. And so now all of our irrigation system, as well as when we have to top off the pond, comes from our own groundwater. And it's never run dry. We don't have to add a whole lot of water to the pond because it was rebuilt and it's pretty tight. We're losing water basically um, to evaporation, not, not any to leakage. Okay. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome.